the reason green has gone Main Street, basically, the reason we've seen this green, quite quiet green revolution emerging in the United States is because of a convergence, a, a, a really a perfect storm. Uh, and that perfect storm was 9-11, Katrina, and the Internet Revolution. And 9-11 flattened the Twin Towers and told us that we're in a war with people who are fueled by our gasoline purchases. Katrina flattened New Orleans and told us that the climate monsters behind the door are starting to come out and potentially could get a lot worse. And the flattening of the world brought three billion new consumers onto the global economic playing field from India, China, Russia, Brazil, all with the American dream, all with their own hopes for a home, a car, a toaster, a microwave, and a refrigerator. And therefore, if we don't find a cleaner, greener way to fuel their dreams and their futures, we're going to burn up, choke up, heat up, and smoke up this planet so much faster than everyone realizes. So what I really try to do in this piece is bring together the geoeconomic, uh, the geostrategic, the climate, and the economic reasons why green has really started to scale politically in the United States. The most important thing we have to understand about the developing world right now, we're talking about the big developing countries like China, India, Brazil, is that they're not going to buy into any restrictions on their growth based on limiting their CO2 emissions. They're not going to do that. Um, we can argue about global warming with them until we're blue in the face, but they are come back to us very understandably. It's going to be say, oh, wait a minute, I get it. You guys got to grow dirty and now you're telling us we get to grow clean? Sorry, that's just not on. And so as a practical matter, it's not on. Therefore, what I try to focus on in this piece is how do we get scalable, clean, emissions-free power at the China price or at the price my friend Vinod Hosta calls the Chindia price, the China-India price, the price at which these technologies will scale in China and India. And that is to say, whatever clean power we're talking about, electricity, biofuels, or you know, just raw you know, power plants, it has to be priced today at a level competitive with the dirtiest coal. Government has a huge role to play in this. And it's in two specific areas. One is to set standards. Look at California. 30 years ago, it set very high efficiency standards for appliances and for buildings. What's the result? Over the last 30 years, per capita, electricity consumption in California has stayed basically flat, while in the rest of the country, it's grown at 50%. So a government that sets really high standards and then says to the market, now you go reach them. And then when the market reaches them, sets a higher standard. That's a government playing the right role. At the same time, government has a big role to play in, in getting our prices right. Government's job, I believe, is to set a carbon tax or a gasoline tax that brace, basically fixes the price of, of a coal and gasoline, of these cheap fuels, at a level where the alternatives will be competitive over the long term and really start to scale. But I think the most important thing we as a country can do is to make ourselves the leader in energy efficient products and clean power systems. Because if we're the leader, others will follow. And most of all, we will bring to bear our incredible innovative prowess on these technologies. And if the rich countries who can afford to do this lead the way, set an example, then I believe the developing world not only will follow, but we'll have then the technologies at the China price faster. If I were to explain the geopolitical challenge of this, I'd put it this way. We in the United States need to bring the price of oil up. So we stimulate the alternatives and the innovation that ultimately will actually bring the global price of oil and energy down. Why is that important? It's important for what I call the first law of petropolitics. The first law of petropolitics, in my view, states that the price of oil and the pace of freedom operate in an inverse correlation. And what you see is that the price of oil, as it goes down, the pace of freedom, it goes up. And as the price of oil goes up, the pace of freedom goes down. And that's what I call the first law of petropolitics. What was the motto of the American Revolution? No taxation without representation. What is the motto of what I call the petro-authoritarian states? States like Iran, Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, Russia. The motto of their leaders is no representation without taxation. Hey, pal, if I don't have to tax you, 
because I can just get all my income from the ground, I don't have to represent you. Right now, I don't think any politicians in America have really leveled with the American people about the scale, the in pure industrial scale of what will be required for us, what it would really take to have an emissions-free grid in this country, to have emissions-free transport fuels. It's a huge industrial project. This could be the biggest transformative concept that's come along in a, in a long, long time. It's about a Green New Deal. And I think it has a huge potential to not only reconnect us with the world, to reconnect us at home, but to really propel us forward economically, scientifically, educationally, industrially into the 21st century.